In this lecture, we will go over the last three families that we are going to talk about, and these are all monocot families, and they are all graminoids. The families are Juncaceae, which are the rushes, Cyperaceae, which are the sedges, and Poaceae, also called Graminae, which are the grasses. Our outline then is pretty straightforward. We'll start by going over what the graminoids are generally, and then we will talk about each of those three groups that I just mentioned. And already I'm going to make one change here. I capitalized graminoids, but we'll see that graminoids is not a formal group, and therefore it doesn't get capitalized. We should have a lowercase g. The graminoids include all three of these families that we just mentioned, and these are all important families, and they are all either grass itself, poaceae, or plants that have a similar growth form to grass, and that is cyperaceae and juncaceae. Importantly, these three are not a monophyletic group, and you can see that pretty clearly on the phylogeny shown here. So on this phylogeny, it's a little bit complicated because we have a polytomy. We have three things branching off here. So let's simplify it and pretend as if this is what the phylogeny looks like. We'll get rid of this line. And then even in this simplified scenario without the polytomy, we could see that this is not a monophyletic group. If we follow back to the most recent common ancestor of those three families on our simplified tree, that would be right here. And then if we follow forward in time, we would see that the group graminoids does not include the common ancestor and all of the descendants because it's leaving out these three families. Consequently, graminoids are paraphyletic and we are going to talk about them because they are convenient, but not because they are a group that is uh, monophyletic. Let's talk now about what are the characteristics of the graminoids. First, they are mostly herbaceous. And so because they are monocots, remember they cannot make true wood. And most of them are going to be um, have soft stems and grow near the ground. There are some exceptions, such as bamboo, which has a tree-like growth form. Remember, we saw an exception to monocots being herbaceous when we talked about palm trees, and we said that those do have a tree-like growth form, even though they don't have typical secondary growth. The same thing, then, is true of bamboo. It is tree-like, um, but it is not growing outward in the mechanism that a dicot tree would do so. They all, um, obviously, are either grass, or they look grass-like. So let's talk about what it means to look grass-like. We're going to introduce a new term called a colm or plural colms, and these are tall, thin, upright, grass-like stems. So if you think about a, let's say, a flowering stem on a grass plant, don't think about the leaves, but the part that's going to have, you know, the flower up here. Those are very tall um, relative or very thin relative to the height that those stems attain. Next, the leaves are long and thin with parallel venation. So you've all seen what a grass leaf looks like. Something like this, maybe a point at the top, and then parallel veins. Broadly speaking, sedges and rushes will have the same form. Third, most members of all three of these families are rhizomatous. And so what this means is that they, if there's a, oops, let's say there's a tuft of grass growing right here, they will be able to send underground stems, that's a rhizome, an underground stem, and start another tuft of grass. They can't necessarily all do this, but it's a typical characteristic of all three of these families. Let's draw one more here. Another characteristic is that the leaves are either basal or they tend to branch off near the bottom of a stem. So a typical growth form here would be something like 
either all of the leaves like this, or perhaps there is a stem. But if there is a stem, it's more common for leaves to branch off down here than to branch off up, let's say, near the top. There's exceptions to this. They certainly are plants that can make leaves near the apices of their stems, but on average, they're concentrated near the bottom. If we think about floral characteristics, all three of these families have members that are primarily wind pollinated. And as a result, they don't need to attract pollinators. Therefore, they have non showy flowers and the perianth just gets in the way of wind. So they have highly reduced or absent perianth. Remember perianth is our sepals and petals. And all three of these groups, like many of the monocot groups we've talked about, have superior pistils. There were some exceptions for some other monocot families. Before we move on, I should point out that this picture of a rush we have is literally growing in the water. This picture of a sedge we have is growing near water. And this picture of grass we have happens to be growing in dry areas. There is a variety of habitats for each of these but we are seeing them all in places where each would typically grow. And we'll talk more about those details as we move into each of the groups. Graminoids typically all occur in open areas. Its growth form, um, having basal leaves, is ideal for this. And so areas where we would typically find them would include places like marshes or grasslands. Now, this is not a universal rule. There are plenty of sedges that grow in forests, and there's also plenty of grasses that would grow in the shade of a forest. So this is sort of on average that I'm saying this. We already mentioned that they have rhizomes, and rhizomes do nicely let them fill open areas such that if one gets established, it can spread and cover a wide area. And importantly, the growth form of these families is tolerant of grazing. And the reason for this is that they are keeping their meristems near the ground. So they're not adding leaves mostly up high on the plant. Instead, they're adding leaves at the base. That means if an animal comes and munches off everything above this line I just drew, then the leaves and stems will be able to continue growing. On a plant like this top one I grew that was growing from an apical meristem, then if the top got cut off, it would have to form new meristems or activate lateral meristems further down. We are going to shift gears now and start talking about these families in smaller groups. I showed you the phylogeny earlier, and on that phylogeny, we saw that the sedges and rushes are together monophyletic. So we have Cyperaceae and Juncaceae, and these families are each other's closest relatives. They have some traits that reflect this. First, they both have three ranked leaves, and we've talked about what leaf ranking means before. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead here because we need to talk about what the stems look like. The most common form for a sedge is to have a broadly triangular growth form, while rushes tend to have roundish growth forms. Nevertheless, if we looked at the order that leaves came off the stem, it might look something like this. So we'll start at the most basal leaves and then we'll follow as the stem grows out of the screen towards us and adds new leaves. It's going to make a leaf at the bottom and then on the side, then on the side. And then the fact that they're ranked means the next leaf will be directly above an apical to the first one I drew. The fifth one would be above this, the sixth one above this, and that pattern would continue. Now, rushes have round stems, but they still have three ranked leaves. So the pattern would be the same. One, two, three, 
and then they would repeat in the same locations. So if you're looking down the stem, you're going to see these open areas where leaves have not formed. There are plenty of plants that don't have ranked leaves, and instead the growth form might look something like that the start, but then the fourth leaf, the fifth leaf, and the sixth leaf wouldn't be overlapping the earlier ones. Cyperaceae and Juncaceae are instead doing this three-ranked pattern. Both of them occur near water, and I gave you a preview of that when we looked at those earlier photographs. Um, this is especially true for the rushes, and it is less true for the sedges. Sedges, many of them grow near water, but there are others that are growing in dry or forested areas. So now let's move on and talk specifically about Juncaceae. Juncaceae, again, is the rushes. And this is the smallest of the three groups of families we're talking about. It's really quite small, only about 400 species. They tend to grow in nutrient-poor areas, suggesting that they are good at surviving where there's low nutrients, but they are not competitive with plants when the area becomes more nutrient rich. As a result, uh, a strategy for conserving Juncaceae would be to prevent eutrophication or addition of uh, nutrients by uh, human activities. There are a bunch of distinctive characteristics for Juncaceae, and we're going to start by talking about their vegetative characteristics. Then we will move on and talk about their reproductive characteristics. The first one we already specified, rushes have round stems. That's nice because they, by common name, they both start with R. So remember, rushes are round. And sometimes round means kind of more oval, but still more round than triangular. Here's a photograph showing this for a rush stem at the top, and we're comparing it to a sedge stem, and I'm giving this away. But we'll see that sedges are more often triangular in cross-section, although there's some exceptions to this. So rushes have round stems. They also have solid stems. So look inside this stem in the top photograph, and you can see it's maybe not thick, but there is cellular material going throughout the stem. This is all filled in. This is going to contrast with grasses, where we'll see that the center of the stem, in many cases, is hollow. Not the whole way up the stem, but at least up large portions of the stem. Let me just mute my... There we go. Uh, mute my email. We've already talked about the fact that Juncaceae has three ranked leaves, um, like Cyperaceae, but unlike the grasses. We'll get to the grasses and we'll see that they are two ranked in a little bit. The leaves are mostly basal or near the base of the stem. This means that there are no nodes going up the stem. Um, this is different than grasses. Out of the three groups, the one that is most likely to have multiple leaves on its comb, if it's a reproductive stem, let's say, then grasses are going to be the ones that have the most leaves. Brushes and sedges tend to not have many or any leaves above the basal area. Okay, so we have talked about vegetative characteristics here the fact that they are round, solid stems, three-ranked, and with basal leaves. Let's move on and talk about their reproductive characteristics. And the most noticeable difference between Juncaceae and the other two groups in terms of their inflorescences and flowers is that Juncaceae have 
showy, well, okay, they're not showy, but they have tuples that are noticeable. So I'm trying to use the word noticeable instead of showy. They aren't showy enough to attract pollinators in most cases, but they are showy enough that we would notice them. The fruit is a capsule, and you can see that illustrated nicely here in a photograph on the left, and you can also see it in the diagrams on the right. And around this fruit, in both the diagrams and in the photograph, you can see these tuples again, like so. If we look up in the upper photograph, we can see that these are typically going to have six tuples. Um, well, it's kind of hard to see in the photograph, so let's look at the diagram near the top right, and you can see pretty clearly one, two, three, four, five, and six. So the number six shouldn't be a surprise, since we said that monocots tend to have uh, perianth parts and floral parts in multiples of three. Here, I just want to show you some of the diversity of what uh, rushes or juncaceae look like. And so they're arbitrarily chosen examples, but you can see that um, there are noticeable tuples, small, but you can see them on the left-hand photograph, and larger and more noticeable in the far right photograph. You can see in the middle that the plants tend to be small. You can also see in both the left and right photographs that the um, combs seem to continue upwards with the um, inflorescences branching off below the top. So you can see that there and you can see it in the left hand photograph somewhere around here. And so that can be a, a helpful trait for recognizing these. So let's talk now about the Cyperaceae or the Sedge family. This family is moderately large. It is considerably larger than the rushes. For the rushes, we said 400 species. And so this family is more than 10 times larger. It is also more common. We've said already that it likes wet open areas, at least many of its species do. However, you can find these elsewhere. Um, there are some common lawn weeds, like the nut sedges, that are in Cyperaceae. There are also some common forest understory species, like um, there's a Carex called Carex pencil vanica, I believe, that is a very common species in uh, northern deciduous forests. So, there are some species that can grow in a wide variety of habitats, but there's also some ecosystems or some habitats that tend to be dominated by sedges. And so let's talk a little bit about what those areas are like. Around the world, areas that are dominated by sedges tend to have water at or near the um, soil surface. What this does is it creates low oxygen environments in the soil, and that tends to deter things like trees and shrubs from being able to grow. As a result, the area remains open and available to plants like sedges. So high water is one characteristic. Next, soil in these areas tends to be mostly or completely organic matter, and so decayed organic matter in the soil is called peat. So the soil is peat dominant, dominated rather than mineral dominated. Third, in some sedge environments, they regularly burn. Um, even though there's water, the fire can either come in seasonally or it can come above the water. And the result of this is that woody vegetation, which would be able to grow up and over the sedges, is kept out. And so the sedges can maintain their dominance. Okay, let's move on now and talk about vegetative traits of the sedges. The first trait that we'll talk about is that they have triangular stems. And we looked at that a little bit earlier already. 
This trait differs from the rushes and the grasses. And there's three examples of that shown at right here. The first one almost has a star-like shape. The second two are more traditionally triangular. Unfortunately, I'll say but, there are some sedges that have a fairly round stem. So if you find a triangular stem, it's a very helpful trait. But if you find a round stem, you should still look at other traits to make sure it is not a sedge. Sedges have solid stems. This is the same as rushes, or at least mostly solid, maybe a tiny gap there. But this trait is different than the grasses. We already said that grasses have hollow stems, typically at least most of the way up the stem, and we'll talk about the exception. So coming back to the sedges, we've already said that they have three ranked leaves, and we drew a picture of that, so I will move on. We've also already said that sedges have leaves either coming out at the base or near the base of the stem, with just a few exceptions of sometimes some bracts up near the inflorescences. But there are not regular nodes along most of the stem, and nodes along the stem is going to be a characteristic of the grasses. So basal leaves, I will underline. We will now move on and talk about the reproductive characteristics. So inflorescence and flower characteristics. Again, for Cyperaceae, these are still the sedges. If we start with the flowers, they have highly reduced perianth. Remember, we saw those six tepals for the rushes. Here, they are even more reduced. They've been reduced to what we could call bristles, like so, maybe a sixth one in the back that we can't quite see. And so there's still evidence that there was perianth, but now it is quite small. Each flower is subtended. So in other words, subtend means there is beneath it and associated with it a bract. And you can see that in the right-hand diagram here. The same flower as on left is shown, but now you can see that there is this bract which folds around it, like so, and has this keel in the back. So this is all one bract. It's almost forming an envelope around the flower. We've talked about the petals being reduced to bristles. The numbers of floral parts varies, but as a typical number, there could be three carpels, three styles, and three anthers, like the, um, the flowers shown at left here. So you can't see that there's three carpels. But if you look up at the style, remember this is usually a good way of counting, you can see clearly that there are three styles and the three stamen and hence three uh, anthers are shown clearly here as well. Now flowers do not occur alone. Instead they are going to occur in tight, small inflorescences which are called spikelets. And they're called spikelets because you know, this means little spike. And so you can see that pretty clearly here. Unfortunately, the book from which this was taken was damaged. And so you'll have to do some imagining of what the details look like. But it's going to be something like this. So you can see that there are many uh, individual flowers in this spikelet. There's only a few sets of anthers because they are not necessarily all flowering at the same time. So it looks like maybe three or four flowers here are flowering and the rest either aren't mature or have already flowered. We will always have a bract beneath the inflorescence. In the case here, it is further down along the penduncle, so we can't see it, but somewhere down there, 
there would be an inflorescence bract as well as each of these individual flower bracts. And there was one more thing I wanted to point out here. Oh, the spikelet form that we're seeing in Cyperaceae, we're going to see a very similar form in the grasses. The details will differ, but this idea that we are going to have many flowers that are very small, packed tightly together, and associated with bracts is going to occur again. So watch for that when we get to the grasses. We'll talk a little bit about uses of sedges or cyperaceae. I'll try to keep common names on these slides. The biggest use is horticulture. And so there are a variety of attractive forms that give some interesting variation to gardens and better homes and gardens the magazine has a suggestion that i'll show you here for a sedge garden you can see that they're cheating there's some things in this illustration that are clearly uh asteraceae for example and not sedges but you can also see a bunch of grass-like forms growing throughout here and these if the magazine is telling the truth are intended to be sedges there are a few species of sedges that have edible tubers and that are harvested for this purpose. And the best known example, at least to me, is um, there is a tuber that is used as part of the flavoring for horchata. Um, I hope I'm saying that correctly. It is a drink that I'm familiar with from uh, Latin or Mexican restaurants, but apparently um, also occurs in Spain and that's pictured up here at the top. And it also, uh, sedges were used um, to make paper. So papyrus is from the sedge family and gives us the you know uh, ancient paper that would have been used uh, back before we developed modern paper technology. I just want to move this so the reference is not obscured. Okay, we will move on now and talk about the third family for this lecture. It's also the one that is a little bit more involved because it has more complex morphology. So this family is the Poaceae or Graminae, the grass family. We've said already that some families that are especially important were allowed to keep their traditional name. And so the Graminae is a conserved name for the Poaceae, that means either of these names is acceptable. This is a large family. It has about 12,000 species. So 12,000 is more than twice, almost, but not quite three times as diverse as the sedges. And ecologically, it's a very important family. It dominates around a quarter of our terrestrial um, plant communities worldwide. So, you know, that's a huge number compared to any other plant family. And it is also cosmopolitan, which simply means that it grows in, in this case, terrestrial environments around the globe. We can find it maybe not quite everywhere, um, as far as I know, not Antarctica, but it occurs everywhere from marine environments. So near the very near the ocean to desert environments it grows at low latitudes it grows up to mountain peaks at all but the highest elevations and i don't know how far north it makes it through the boreal uh, regions or up into the arctic but certainly fairly far north and while we tend to think of grasses as dominating open areas i'm just going to remind you again that bamboo is a grass and bamboo forms forest-like groves. If you've ever had bamboo growing in your yard uncontrolled, then you know that it very quickly will form a fairly dense forest that is hard to remove. Um, and so in areas in Asia, then there are forests that are dominated by grass. Um, and bamboo is also invasive around the world so um, unfortunately there's other parts of the world that also have these forests right now we do not have native bamboo 
in um, South Carolina, but we do have Arundinaria, which is a bamboo-like plant. It doesn't get anywhere near as big, but you could easily find it growing six or eight feet tall um, in near water, especially just in the Spartanburg area. I want to talk a little bit about the importance of grasses for our ecosystems. And grass communities are important across North America. They are maintained by a combination of grazing of you know, wild or possibly domesticated animals, as well as by fire. So I'll show you two pictures here. The first is of North American prairie. And you can see that um, prairie occurred, hmm, I'm looking at this map and realizing that this is actually not a complete map of the prairie. So this is showing areas where various different kinds of prairie have occurred throughout the um, Great Basin. But prairie actually extended all the way through parts of Wisconsin, certainly through Illinois, parts of Indiana, and there was even a peninsula of prairie that occurred through parts of Michigan. So I'm just going to eyeball this and add a whole bunch more prairie back in here. So prairie was a dominant ecosystem throughout the American Midwest and Great Basin. Um, now a lot of that land has been taken up by either grazing or by um, agriculture, but there are still small pockets of prairies left throughout this area. I happen to do my research on prairies right out here on the very western edge of Iowa. We think of grasslands as being important in the Midwest, and we think of the Southeast as being forested. It turns out that's not completely true. It's only partially true. So if we look at this map at the bottom, this is the southern states, sort of showing approximately this area. And what we can see is that large chunks of southern states, in fact, had a lot of grassland. This grassland was savanna. So savanna refers to open grasslands that has scattered trees, but it also has enough space between the trees that light is making it down all the way to the forest floor. And so there's reports from um, early explorers of seeing bison wandering in South Carolina, and bison are a species that would only occur in areas that have grass. Um, so you can see even where we are in Spartanburg would have been something like a savanna rather than just a closed canopy forest pre-European times. And the extent of grasslands would have varied with climatic variation like rainfall and temperature, but it would have also varied with human practices so especially um, regular burning to maintain that openness by Native Americans. There are now conservation efforts underway to try to restore some of that savanna habitat throughout the Southeast um, by using management techniques like burning. Of course, we have other problems with management in the Southeast, including increasing population density, and so just losing habitat to conversion for human use. So before we get into the characteristics of the plants, let's talk a little bit about how members of the grass family are used economically. And the place that we'll start is with cereals. So cereals, remember, are grains that come from the grass family, and together these are are our most important food crops. Somewhere around half of all calories consumed by humans worldwide, and by consumed I mean directly consumed, come from grains. And so that's impressive because many of the calories that we consume that aren't in this half are also coming from grains. They're just doing so indirectly. And by this, I mean that we grow a lot of grains, which we then feed to animals, which could be anything from, let's say, chickens to cows. 
And then we either eat them or we eat their products, such as eggs and dairy. And so given that half of all of our calories are coming directly from grains and that large portions of the diet of animals that um, people eat, or at least some people eat, come from grains, that means most of our calories are either directly or indirectly coming from grains. And development of human civilizations, in fact, coincided with domestication of grains. I won't say that this is necessarily true for all human civilizations, but if we think about three important ones, we had the region, the Fertile Crescent region, that um, more broadly included the Eastern Mediterranean and Western Asia. And in this region, we had domestication of wheat and barley. At a similar time in China, we had domestication of rice and millet. And in North America, I think slightly later, we had domestication of corn, which even though we think about it as a vegetable, is really a seed from the grass family and hence qualifies um, as a grain. So with all three of these um, civilizations, development seems to have occurred or at least coincided because of the ability to domesticate um, grass species. What I'm showing you up in this top right picture is just a reminder of what the plant looks like from which we domesticated the corn. So this is Teosinte, and you can see by this quarter here that these are very small ears, and the ears would have broken apart and so been hard to collect seeds from. And so there were a number of changes that had to occur for Teosinte to be domesticated into modern varieties of corn. So the gist of the slide is, slide rather, is that the grass family is important because it gives us a lot of our food. It is also important for other reasons. Um, grass can be used to make thatch. So thatch is, if you think of a traditional hut, if the roof is made from a grass-like material, that probably is in fact mostly grass. Interestingly, um, bamboo, which remember is a grass, can be used to make scaffolding. And so this building here, which looks like it's what, 10 or 15 stories tall, has scaffolding going the whole way up, made exclusively of bamboo. And that seemed extremely unlikely to me, but in the little bit of time I've spent traveling in Hong Kong, it was normal to see bamboo scaffolding along buildings. Apparently, because it's a little bit more flexible, it's actually more stable and making scaffolding than would be steel, at least according to, to a report I read about this. Um, let's give a shout out to a couple of other food items that come from the grass family. Uh, one of my favorites is sugar cane, which gives us most of the sugar we eat. Some sugar we eat does come from beets and the caryophyllaceae, but the majority comes from sugar cane. And since, um, Lemongrass is my favorite restaurant in Spartanburg. I'll give a shout out to Lemongrass. This is, of course, a grass and it has a lemon flavor, hence the name. And it would be typically used in making a broth for, let's say, soup. And we've already said that animals get fed um, grains, but they also can be fed or bedded in hay and straw. So a whole bunch of uses for the grass family. We will move on now and we'll talk about some of the vegetative traits of the grass family. And the first trait is that like the rushes, the stems are more or less round. You can see up in this corn, okay, it's not perfect, but it's more round than triangular. And so that will be a helpful trait. We've said a couple of times now that stems in the grasses tend to be hollow mostly. So you can see this uh, longitudinal section of wheat. This area is hollow and this area is hollow. The place that's typically not hollow is at the nodes where leaves, leaves attach. You can see it is solid 
across the middle of this node. Now, I will say there are some grasses that are not hollow, even at the internodes. And so this is a useful trait, but it's not 100%. Oh, say that right here. They are not always, always hollow. We said that for both Juncaceae and Cyperaceae, the leaves are three ranked. For Poaceae or Graminae, the leaves are two ranked. So if the, again, if we're looking down at the stem and looking where the first leaf forms, and then the second leaf, it's like this. The third leaf will form directly above the first, the fourth above the second, and that pattern repeats itself. So we'll never get leaves forming out in this region or out in this region. That is distinctive and that should always be true as far as I know. And so it's a reliable trait. Um, I'm just gonna show you down here at the bottom, right a cross section through, um, I guess this is wheat. And you can see for wheat, unlike corn, the stem here is completely hollow in the middle. Um, and so this would give us straw, which obviously we use the word straw now to mean a hollow tube through which we might drink. So with regard to vegetative traits, we've said the leaves are two ranked. They may spread by various mechanisms. We said earlier that all three of these families have species that typically have rhizomes. Some grasses may also have stolons. If a rhizome is an underground stem, so that's the ground level, here's a rhizome, then the stolon is an above ground stem. Same idea, it's going to go start a new plant. It's just gonna do it by moving over the soil instead of through the soil. So this is our stolon and this is our rhizome. They may also form tillers. And tillers are similar to stolons, but instead of spreading widely at a distance away, a tiller instead is going to send up a new stem immediately adjacent to um, the previous stem. And you can see that illustrated nicely here. We've got our main stem, and then we have a tiller coming off to the left, which is starting to make its own leaves. So three mechanisms by which they can spread by stems. And depending on what strategy is used, the grass will either be a grass that spreads or a grass that forms a larger and larger clump. If it can only make tillers, it's going to be a clump former. But if it can make stolons or rhizomes, then it may spread more widely. The next trait that we'll talk about with regard to grasses is how the stems elongate. And they do this differently than most plants. They elongate at their nodes. So we've said that they have nodes or places of leaf attachment along the culm. This is our culm or our stem. And nodes are where new leaves are going to form, like so. And they're two ranked, so I'll draw this one over here. So What's interesting about grasses is that instead of having a meristem only at the top of the stem, up here, an apical meristem, they instead have what's called an intercalary meristem, and that's right here. So an intercalary meristem is associated with the top of each node, and it is going to add new tissue above the result of which is that it's going to push the stem upward. So that's going to cause the stem to elongate. But because grasses have multiple nodes along each stem, and each one of these has an intercalary meristem, just draw one more in right here, what that means is if they are all elongating, then grass stems can grow upwards very quickly. So this is a mechanism for fast growth. Leaves and grass do the same thing. In a typical leaf, if you imagine a small, I don't know, birch leaf, it is going to have tissue that is 
um, elongating or making new cells throughout when it is young. And so the entire leaf is going to be growing and I'm going to try to draw in little arrows all over this. In contrast in the grass, the new tissue is being added at the base, only down here. And so there's intercalary marrow stems at the base of grass leaves too. This is important because if you imagine a cow or a deer coming along and cutting off the entire top part of this plant, then it still needs to be able to grow. And by having these uh, marrow stems down below, if it does get tissue removed, either by being eaten or by being mowed or perhaps by being burned in a fire, then it will be able to produce new leaf tissue as well as new stem tissue. So this makes it well suited to living in habitats with both herbivores and fire. So we will now get into more of the nitty gritty of unusual grass characteristics. One characteristic is that leaf petioles sheath the stem in grasses. So you can see that on this diagram here, there's a stem going up the middle, something like this, but then you can see each of these leaves has tissue that surrounds the stem. The node for this leaf isn't right here, it's somewhere much further down. And the leaf is surrounding the stem up to a point where it finally diverges from the stem. And they've cut off the lower two leaves right here on the right and right here on the left to make that more obvious. And you can see, I'm going to go forward and back to get rid of my drawing. You can see for these two leaves that they really are going around the stem. Here's the pedial. Oops. Here is that sheathing tissue here, and then probably around this point, this leaf would peel off from the stem like so. This sheath is important for a couple of reasons. It provides protection to the stem, but more importantly, it provides support. We've said that combs or graminoid stems are narrow and tall. Well, that is gonna be really likely to fall over and so by having this accessory tissue of the leaves surrounding it, it's going to allow that stem to get taller simply by providing structural support. Now, something unusual happens right at this point where the leaf blade or lamina diverges from the sheath. So right here and right here. We're gonna zoom in so we can see what that looks like in the larger diagram. At this point, there's usually a collar of tissue that is surrounding the stem. And that collar can take a couple of forms. In this diagram, it looks like hairs or sort of a fringe. In other times, this can actually be a membrane. So this would all be one continuous piece of tissue. And for some species, this feature is absent. The name of this feature is a ligule. And so if you are king out grasses, you'll often see questions about the size or shape of the ligule. This is what it was referring to. The word ligule is related to the word linga, in other words, related to tongue. So you can think about this as being a strap or a tongue of tissue. Um, at this point along the leaf. We've now talked about several um, vegetative traits of the, of the grasses. We talked about their sheathing leaves and their ligules on those leaves. We talked about their intercalary marrow stems, and we talked about three different ways that they can spread. Those ways were rhizomes, stolons, and tillers. We are now going to move on and talk about the inflorescence structure. Just like Cyperaceae or the sedges, this is going to be a small spike and hence be called a spikelet. This is the most basic unit. We're going to add some complications to this after we describe the basic unit. 
So the spikelet then is a small spike of flowers and at its very base, it will always have two sterile bracts. These are not going to be associated with individual flowers themselves. Instead, these are just going to be part of the unit of the spikelet. These bracts have a name, and I don't know the origin of this name, but it is gloom. And so people will say, grasses are gloomy. I almost said glasses are groomy. Grasses are gloomy, and that is a way, a mnemonic to help you remember the word gloom. Let's look at our diagram over on the right. What we're seeing here, this whole thing is a spikelet. And you can see there are several florets, each of which is labeled. Then at the bottom, there are two glooms labeled. The first empty gloom and the second empty gloom. And they're empty because they are not associated with flowers. Just like in the Asteraceae, because these are small flowers aggregated together, we're using the diminutive term floret. This literally just means little flower. So there's no flower here and there's no flower right here. So grasses are gloomy, their inflorescence, uh, smallest structure therein are spikelets. Now let's put together how spikelets are connected. The inflorescences are almost always going to be compound inflorescences. And so they're going to have multiple levels of organization within them. And there are a lot of different possibilities here, but I will just show you a few. One possibility to start in the middle is that there could be a compound inf inflorescence, which is a spike of spikelets. So each one of these little sections I've drawn, I'll draw one more here, is itself a spikelet. Sorry, that's a spike lit. And there are then several spikelets contributing to this compound spike. Another possibility is that we could have a raceme of spikelets shown on the left here. Or we could have a more branched inflorescence pattern, which we would term a panicle. And so here we would have a panicle for all three of these, these are of spikelets. And so which kind of inflorescence occurs would be important to king out a grass. Other differences are how compact they are. So are those spikelets really up close and touching each other? Or are they more spaced out as shown here? And we could have additional levels of compoundness. So we could have spikes of spikes of spikelets, for example. That would all be important also in king out these plants. Now let's move on from the inflorescences and look at an individual flower. We said that the spikelets each have a pair of bracts at their base. The same thing is going to be true for individual flowers. So on this diagram, we're looking at a single flower with a pedicel. You already know that word. And as we move up, the next thing that we're going to see are these two bracts. These are where petals should be, but these are not actually petals. They are presumably modified leaves instead. Each of these bracts has a name. The more basal of the two bracts is called the lemma. I don't know where these words come from. And so the lemma tends to be the, the larger of the two and the more basal of the two. And it is terminated in a structure, sometimes a pointy long extension at the tip. If that's there, it is called an on. This is sort of a covering, kind of like the covering on the door would be called an awning. I assume that does come from the same word. The smaller of the two bracts and the one that is more apical is called the palea. 
And we already said that it's smaller. Because the lemma is outside and these tend to fold, that means that the paleo the paleo is going to be partially enclosed by the lemma. Grass flowers do not have perianth, and so it is absent. We saw it was present but small in the rushes, even smaller in the uh, cyperaceae, and now we've gone to completely gone. There are typically three stamen and two to three carpels, although numbers can vary a little bit. The fruit of a grass is a caryopsis. This is a term we've talked about before. And remember in the caryopsis, the seed coat is going to be attached to the carpel. And so they are inseparable. Typically with the grass, the palea and lemma are also going to disperse with the grass seed. Now the palea and lemma are separable. And so for human food, if we wanted to eat, let's say a wheat grain or an oat grain, one of the steps in that process is threshing, um, which is removal of the palea and lemma, as well as other material like the stems from the grass. I was going to show you a video of this, but since the lecture has gone long, I'll just describe the process. Basically, this would involve either hitting the grass with something or hitting the grass against the ground to break it apart, and then either throwing it up in the air on a blanket or putting it in front of a fan so the lighter material, the less dense lemma and palea, get blown away and the more dense grass seeds would fall downwards um, and be collected into a container. Let's end this lecture with a summary. First, remember the graminoids include the grasses and two other families that resemble the grasses. To review Juncaceae or the rushes, this was the smallest of the three families. They occur almost always around water. They have solid stems. They don't have nodes except perhaps low on the stem or at the base and they have six noticeable tepals. Cyperaceae, or the sedges, are the intermediately diverse family out of these three. They occur around water, um, but also in some other habitats. They usually, but not always, have triangular stems. They again have few nodes above their base. They have a subtending bract around each flower, and their perianth is reduced to just being hairs or bristles. Finally, the family we spent the most time on was the Poaceae or Graminae family. And I just fixed the spelling of Graminae right here. So the grasses. And the Poaceae are the most diverse of these three families, two or three times more diverse than the sedges. They occur in a range of habitats. They have round or roundish stems, and the stems in most species are hollow, except at the nodes. They also have specialized inflorescences that include sterile glooms, which are bracts at their base, and each flower itself has two bracts, the palea and the lemma. That then concludes our entire tour of plant families for this semester.